Okay. So today, uh, we will focus on planting the rain, so harvesting the rainwater in the soil for use by the vegetation. And I, uh, I think it's, the way I like to start is with general principles, general concepts, not specifics. Uh, I think it's more important that you be able to figure out what would be appropriate for what context. And to start from there. Otherwise, if I start with a specific strategy, you might try and use that strategy, whether it's appropriate or not. So I think it's more important that you um, understand what's happening on the land and then decide what might be the appropriate action. OK, so yesterday I talked about this erosion triangle. So we have speed, volume, depth for the triangle. And if you can reduce any one of these in terms of water flow, you will reduce erosion. Okay. Uh, okay. So Let's see an example of how we might use that. So here is uh, a slope, more gradual slope, then a steep slope, and then more gradual again. Where are we going to have most erosion? Here, here, or here? Yeah, and here because we have a steeper slope. So we will increase the speed. And on this slope, are we going to have more erosion here or here? Down? Yes. We'll have more erosion here because, whoops, we will also have more volume. Okay. Because all the rain hitting here will move there too. All right. And if the water flowing along here concentrates into a channel, we will also increase the depth and have even more erosion. So uh, where do you think, okay, also when water flows, we also have sediment flowing. So up here, it's a gradual slope. So sediment will drop out of the water. Okay. It'll accumulate here. Here, it's very steep, so sediment will flow with the water. It will be taken away. And here, where again we have a gradual slope, sediment will accumulate. So we call this depositional, it deposits soil, and this is erosional, it erodes soil. Okay? Clear enough? Okay. 
So where do you think would be the best place to harvest water, to start harvesting water? Here, here, or here? At the top, okay. At, or at the bottom? Okay. Anyone think here? Okay. Huh? De uh, yeah, de that's true. Depends on what you're trying to do. Okay. I would say, yeah, the, the water harvesting principle says start at the top. You can start there. But if you only have a limited amount of time and resources, then you start here. Okay? Because here, you have more water. So you're more likely to be successful. And you have more fertility, more sediment is coming to you. Okay? Uh, but if I have more resources, I can also work here. And this is the last place I would work. It's too difficult. OK. Um, but if I did want to work here, I would focus on vegetation, not earthworks. So a simple way to start to fix this area is to plant uh, native grasses uh, or other vegetation that can grow on this slope. So I plant the rain here, maybe with a swale, and I plant the vegetation. And then, then the seed will always be dropping on the slope. So I'm more likely to get plants to germinate here because of the seed coming from here. And, and the water I collect here will move through the soil here. OK? All right. So uh, a typical pattern is an alluvial fan. <coughs> where we have a channel that's narrow, and then it widens out. Okay. In the alluvial fan, you do not want to build there. OK? Because the water will spread out, and different channels will move across. It's a great place to plant trees because the, there's more water being spread out and you have deep soils of porous soil. Okay? Any questions? Or any? So, and here is a small alluvial fan. So we have bad erosion on the steep slope. And here is where the soil is being deposited. So all over the world, where you have traditional dry land agriculture, this is the primary place where people plant their crops and harvest their water. Because the water comes to them and the fertility comes to them. All right. uh, and in this instance, I would not try to fix that erosion. Because it can't go any further than the top of that hill. So I'm going to use the erosion to my benefit by working here. 
could have got uh, trees uh, in the valleys. Uh, you could. So. You, you could, but I would focus planting here. Okay, crops. Oh, I forgot the light. Ok, allora le, le, pianterò uh, delle mie colture sotto e alberi magari per limitare l'erosione nelle valli. Uh, have, have to plant crops uh, in the, um, uh, below mm -hmm. and uh, trees in the valleys to limit the, uh, the sediment going down. Uh, you could, but again, in this instance, the sediment is not a problem, really. Not, not in the big picture. We can let this heal itself. We don't need to do the work uh, because it's a very small area. Okay. I show this slide because when I first saw this, I wanted to fix that. I, th I think most people want to fix it. But erosion is not always bad. Okay. Okay. So uh, we are we are looking at uh, from above down at grass, and you can see the water flowing through the grass. Yeah. So this is sheet flow. When water flows across the landscape very shallow. And when the water is clear, everything is good. Okay? It's very calm. It's not erosion. But when the grass starts to get further apart, and we have more and we have more bare soil then when the water flows through it starts to pick up more soil you can see it's now cloudy water because it's full of soil so this is a sign that we should try and increase vegetation. Then it gets even worse when the vegetation gets even fur why is it doing that? Uh, even further apart. Uh, and now we can see that the vegetation is on a higher soil than where there's no vegetation because it's being pulled away with the water. Okay. So this landscape holds less water and dries out more quickly. This is even worse. <laughs> now you can see, <sighs> you can see we have little hills. Um, we call these pedestals. We call it a pedestal. Pedestal? I say that right? <laughs> okay, here is another one. The rock protected the soil underneath. So we have this little island of soil. <coughs> One way you can monitor your sheet erosion is to put a big nail in the ground to where the nail is level with the top of the soil and put some flagging on it and just watch how quickly the soil drops. Okay. Okay. It gets even worse when the sheet flow concentrates to channelized 
flow. Okay, because now we are increasing depth, potentially speed, and volume. Because all the water that was spread out now concentrates to a smaller area. Okay. That's not good. Okay. So we concentrate our roof water to a small spot with our roof downspouts. And sometimes we have a steep slope. So we can line the channel with rock on the steep section until the gradual section. That's one way we can mitigate the channel flow. OK. In a, a bigger landscape, sometimes sheet flow concentrates and we get a big gully cut of erosion. We, if we go from sheet flow to channel flow, we can cut the erosive cliff back, making a more gradual slope, and then line it with rock, like there. Uh, so that it does not erode anymore. But it's very important that this rock not be higher than this point. Because if this rock is higher than this point, then all the water will flow around your structure and make more erosion. Water takes the path of least resistance. So you have to make the easiest path for water to be the path where you want the water to flow. OK. All right. Um, When we have a pipe under a road, the water on the up slope side accumulates, and then more pressure is pushed through the pipe. So it's like a rifle barrel, and we get more erosion here because we've increased the speed and the volume. <laughs> so one way we can fix this is to reduce speed and reduce volume and reduce depth, or one of those three. So here we have a pipe under a road And then we put what I call a sheet flow spreader <laughs> across here. It's a structure that's only one rock high, about this big, many rocks wide. The bigger the flow, the wider the structure. And it's absolutely level. That's the contour line right there. Except for the very ends, which go uphill. Because you, you don't want the water to go around. You want it to go over. Okay. 
So this takes concentrated water and spreads it out. So we turn channelized flow into sheet flow. And when we build the structure, we put lots of native grass seed under the rock. So after the rains, this is what it looks like. And after more time, that's what it looks like. You can't see it. <laughs> so the, the vegetation is more important than the rock. That's why we put the seed down. Because it's much more effective at slowing more water and more sediment and spreading it out even more. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Yeah. <coughs> Microphone. <laughs> Mi chiedevo se col tempo fosse ancora efficace lo strato di pietra o se fossero efficaci solo le piante. I mean, um, I, I would like to know if uh, with time is still effective the stone uh, moon mm -hmm. <laughs> or is just um, a work made uh, from plants? Yeah. So uh, it will still be effective over time because uh, we have that pipe with the concentrated water. So uh, if we have a really big flow, the rocks with the plants is stronger. So, yeah. OK. Uh, if we don't spread the water out, we will get a, a head cut gully. Okay. Okay. So a head cut is when here we have sheet flow water that concentrated and started cutting the soil and created a waterfall. And when water tr goes over the waterfall, it really increases its speed. And then it cuts more and more and more. So the water flows downhill, but the head cut cuts headward or upslope. Okay. Okay, so uh, many times people will put a gabion across a head cut. You know gabion, yeah? No? Okay, so because I think that's an Italian term, but it's an Italian technical term. <laughs> so a gabion is a, uh, uh, a rock burrito. <laughs> so it's a... Uh, Gabiona? Okay. So, so do you, you all know Gabiona? Okay. But uh, uh, a Gabion is a rock wall wrapped in wire. And uh, it's OK, but it's a temporary fix because the structure will fail when the wire rusts. It's completely dependent on that wire. Okay? This is why I don't like gabions. Okay? Um, so a better structure is a Zuni bowl. Um, why Zuni? Zuni are Zuni Indians who invented this. 
Okay. Uh, so uh, up here, we have a head cut. And in the dry times, this is the driest place in the landscape because there's no vegetation. It's exposed soil. But in the wet times, it's the wettest because that's where all the water concentrates and flows over. So let's use a structure that works with that. So you can cut the cliff back so it's more gradual. <coughs> and then you lay it with rock, like a rock rundown. Okay, and then at the bottom, you create a bowl, a pool. So your biggest rocks are here. So then, when it rains, this pool fills with water, and you have more moisture infiltrating into the structure to grow more vegetation to stabilize the structure. Okay. Because remember what I said yesterday, my goal is to create living systems, not dead systems. So we set up the rock in a way to reduce erosion and encourage the growth of more living vegetation. Okay? This is very technical, very specific. <laughs> you don't need to remember this. <laughs> okay. Um, you don't need to remember what I'm going to tell you now. <laughs> this is more technical stuff. Okay. But if you look at the Zuni bowl from <coughs> above, that's what it looks like. If you look at it from the side, this is what it looks like. So the water goes down the slope, fills the pool, overflows, and then we create a one rock dam below it to create a second pool. Uh, but this is, a, this is not a structure I would start with. This is more complex. So don't worry if you don't get this. Um, all right, uh, I'm going to go on to simpler things first, okay? All right. When you have a slope that is steeper, say 4% or more, and you have a water channel, the way nature diffuses the force of the flowing water is with stepped pools. That's what you see in the mountains. So water goes over the waterfall, hits a pool of water, it's slowed down, hits another waterfall, speeds up, but then hits a pool of water, is slowed down. Okay. So if that's what nature does in a steeper slope channel, that's what we do. And that's why we do the Zuni Bowl in that context. That's what I want you to remember. Mimic nature. Don't worry about the technical <coughs> structure. And uh, when we start to get uh, an erosive channel, 
it can go from a stable channel to a deep cutting channel. The shaded area is your normal water flow. The <laughs> dotted line is your flood flow. So in the flood flow, in a healthy condition, the water comes out of the channel and into the flood plain. It's very uh, shallow flow spread out very far. Okay? That's good. But if the channel starts to cut, then it can get so deep that in the flood flow, water cannot get out of the channel. And the only way the water flow can diffuse its energy is to cut deeper and to cut wider. Okay? <coughs> so, uh, the way nature will heal an erosive gully is it will cut the sides, the banks. And it will eat the banks to get soil to put back in the bed. And it's doing better and better the bigger the flood plain it forms within the channel. <coughs> so <coughs> before the erosion, when there was flood flow, water could spread out very far. Now it cannot spread out. Now it can spread out a little more. There's a tiny flood plain. <laughs> As it gets healthier, there's a little more flood plain. It's getting better. <laughs> Even better. And eventually, it is fairly healthy again. Okay, I show this because when I learned this, this freaked me out. <laughs> because what it's saying is the way you heal erosion is with more erosion. That was very hard for me to understand. Okay, but this is one way we can heal this erosion. We never get the water to flow back up here again. But we heal the conditions within the channel. So, this is one of my teachers. And he is standing next to where the soil used to be. These are the roots of the tree. So this gully cut down very deep. So what we are doing is creating simple rock structures that will purposely eat more of the bank to fill the bed. OK. Um, because we want to get back to a meandering waterway. And when we have less than a 4% slope, the way a water channel slows its flow is by meandering <coughs> instead of running straight. OK. Um, hmm. Okay, and within the meander, at the straight sections, between 
the bends, we can put a one rock high dam, a one rock high structure. <coughs> Okay, it's only one rock high, but multiple rocks wide. And you put seed under all the rock. So that's right after construction, and that's after the rain. Now it's important that your rocks come up a little bit on the side so water does not flow around it. It's also important that the rocks on the downslope side, you put the first row of rocks beneath, sorry, uh, into the soil so the top of the rock is level with the, the level of the channel. Otherwise, you will create an erosive waterfall. So they made a mistake here. They used the biggest rocks on the downslope side which is good because they hold the small rocks upslope. <coughs> but they did not anchor it into the soil. That's bad. So they created a waterfall that's that high. And you can see the erosive hole caused by the falling water. So that was fixed by just putting rocks in the hole. <laughs> and then the top of the rock was level with the bottom of the bed, and everything was good. OK? When this fills up with uh, sediment on the upslope side, and vegetation grows through the rock, Then you can build a second structure on top of the first using the bottom half of the first structure as your stabilized spillway. Okay, any questions on this? Uh, mh, può, questa storia del, del riempire con altre pietre si può fare finché la pendenza non raggiunge le, 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 la, la percentuale che noi vogliamo. Uh, we will do this action to put new stones uh, in the upper flow, in the upper part of the flow, until we reach the steepness we want, the, uh, the slope we want uh, from the upper part to the down part. I, I don't know. Uh, why we add further stones uh, in the upper part. Mm -hmm. So the reason you might, you don't have to, but the reason you might add a second structure on top of the first is to lift the water flow even higher so that maybe in the big flood flows, sheet flow goes out again to more area. Yeah. So we will not reach the steepness of 4% in this way. Uh, we will have to uh, keep our uh, uh, steepness, our slope, uh, beneath uh, mm. under 4% in this okay. way. Dobbiamo mantenere comunque la, 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 la tendenza sotto il 4% in questa maniera. Don't worry about the 4% for your structure. Okay? If there is more than 4% in a channel, then stepped pools are the strategy. In a waterway that is less than 4%, the meander is the typical way. You can do this 
in both. You can put it in a meandering waterway or you can use it to create <laughs> stepped pools. Okay. All right. Um, this is a friend that built a one rock high dam. And so that's before, that's after. You can see how it spreads the water out more of the channel. Compare it to that width. Now it's much wider. And can you see how the water flow is rough? But here it's very smooth because more water is backing up. It's slower. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's slower. It's deeper, but it's slower. OK. Uh, back to this. The One Rock Dam accumulates sediment. Yeah? It catches sediment. So put it where sediment naturally collects. In a waterway, sediment naturally collects in two locations. The inside of a bend, but it cuts <coughs> sediment out on the outside of the bend. So we don't want a structure there because it will get eaten out on the outside. So we need to look at the second place where sediment accumulates, which is in the straight run between bends, between meanders. That's where we put the one rock check dam. Because it won't cut out, it won't erode as likely. Okay? And this is also where we always want to put a road crossing or a path crossing. But people almost never pay attention to that when they build a road across a waterway. Okay, any questions on that? All right. Um, I'm going to leave that. That's too much. OK. So here is a meandering waterway. And in every straight section between bends, there is a one rock dam. And after the rains, this is what it looked like. So maybe you look at this and say, it's still very dry. There's still a lot of dirt. But where I'm from, it's great if you get some vegetation. OK. All right, so. <laughs> and it will just keep growing. OK, let's skip by that. All right. Um, just two more slides, and then we'll take a break. So uh, a teacher of mine, he reworked this drainage, which is very erosive uh, and very narrow. Oops. Uh, so I don't have. OK. So uh, he used those one rock dams. and some other structures that made the waterway meander even more. And as a result, let's see if this will work. Yeah. He was able to increase the width 
of the waterway. Ah, I need to convert that from, uh, three, four, from four meters to uh, 10 meters wide. Okay, so now the water spread out over much more area. The floodplain, the area the water flows out onto, was increased from six meters to 40 meters. I hope I'm doing the math right. <laughs> okay. And uh, they were able to bring back perennial water pools and raise the water table three and a half meters. Okay. <laughs> they were able to do this by slowing down the water, spreading it out. Okay. So you don't have to worry about the specific strategies how. Just know that it occurred from spreading it out and shallowing and slowing down the water. Okay, any questions on that? Okay. Uh, if you want more information on this project and these strategies, uh, I can give you the, uh, the website. Oh, shit. Sure. I think it was written in the last. Was it? Uh, Kivira uh, Coalition? Slide. Yeah, I wrote yesterday, but I think in one of the last slides was written. Oh, wait, there was, was more slides. Kivira Coalition. Kivira Coalition, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry, there's three more slides, and then I'll stop. Okay. Now, this looks more like a gabion, but there's no wire. But see, it's many rocks high, not one rock high. You're more likely to have success if you only go one rock high. It's less likely to blow out or to be damaged. And the risk is when you go many rocks high, you create a steeper, taller waterfall that can be more erosive. <coughs> so to play it safe and easy, I only build check dams multiple rocks high on top of bedrock. So then the bedrock will not erode from the falling water. Okay. And this is also the best place to create a spring. Because all the water stored in the soil behind the dam, it can't go down because of the bedrock. So it will come out through the wall and create a spring. Okay. It works really well. <laughs> okay. uh, this is a bigger one with bigger rocks. And that's my hat, <laughs> so you can see the size. Can you see that behind the big rock, they did smaller rock, and then smaller rock, and then gravel. So you keep getting smaller and smaller in size. And that's important, because if you only did the big rock and then soil, water would shoot through the cracks. You, you need the smaller rock slowing down the water and holding the soil back. <coughs> but you can do this with only one rock tall structures. You still get a spring. Okay. Is it soil on the top or water? 
Yeah, there's some water and some soil. Yeah. Okay. And that's that's it for this section. Any any questions before we break? Okay, I hope that wasn't too much. <laughs> if if anything was confusing, then just remember the erosion triangle. <laughs> okay? And remember, if you break any one of the three points, you lessen the erosion. OK? That's good enough. <laughs> OK, so let's take a 20-minute break. Is that right, 20 minutes? Do we do 20 minutes? Oh, and let's mark the gnomon outside with the sun. Yeah. OK. So we're good? Can, can I start? OK. OK. So I had a little too much coffee, so I might talk a little bit faster this time. So um, just kidding. <laughs> okay. All right. So now uh, we will look at different uh, water harvesting earthworks for different situations. So first off, to review what we said yesterday, we have most chance of success when we collect water or we get rainfall and runoff. Okay? So Simple pattern for pathways, roads, is raise your road, pathway, or driveway, and depress the planting area next to it. Okay, same thing with the roof of a house. And this is nothing new. This is very old. This is a photograph from the Negev Desert in Israel where researchers rehabilitated an ancient Nabataean runoff farm that was many thousands of years old. They get uh, 10, uh, sorry, 100 <laughs> millimeters of rain a year and yet they, on only that rain, they were growing pomegranates, carob, pistachios, figs, grapes, and much more. Okay? But it's different in the appearance from an orchard here. Because they get much less rain than you. So the trees are much further apart. And they are planted in a low spot. That's the low spot. And then the, the rest of the ground slopes or drains water to the plant. Okay. Depending on the water needs of the plant, the catchment area that drains water to the plant gets bigger or smaller. Okay. Um, this is in Syria. They were growing salt bush, Atriplex uh, canensis. Uh, as forage for animals. And you can see each bush is at the low point of the catchment area. <coughs> okay? And they get, uh, yeah, 359 millimeters of rain. For their fields, 
Here it's wheat. Here it's garbanzo beans or lentils. They have a area of no plants that drains water to the contour planting of wheat. Then another bare area draining water to the next contour of wheat. Question. Why does the contour go in that curve and not in the opposite direction to catch the water? Okay, so perché la curva del, um, uh, del grano è, è piantata in quella curva, in quella direzione e non nella dire, in una curva opposta di modo da raccogliere l'acqua che scende? O forse lo vedo male? Okay, because the contour line is always absolutely level. Okay, whereas some of the structures I showed you in the previous talk, most of it is level, but it curves up on the upslope side. Here, uh, here it is always sheet flow. It was never concentrated, so we can just be level. Okay. Above the fields are the olive orchards. And they all have boomerang <laughs> berms. So the slope comes this way. The berm is like an open-armed hug because we love that water. <laughs> so like, come to Papa, <laughs> okay? Um, and next to the orchard is this ancient cistern. Under this land, it looks like this underground. The same as the cisterns by the road built the same way. So water comes off the hill, collects, there's two sediment traps, and then it goes into the tank. And it can overflow to the olives and the fields. Okay. Uh, oops. Okay. All right. Um, so now uh, I want to show you some water harvesting in the... Wait. Hold on. Um, we will build some boomerangs after lunch. Okay. And put some new plants in. Mm -hmm. Come mai il troppo pieno di quelle due cisterne a quel percorso che passa per quella per quell'area ancora quell'area che dovrebbe essere uh, allagata? Uh, why uh, the overflow of the two cisterns uh, make that path? Uh, there is a uh, um, I think there is a, another uh, wide area there. This one here? Uh, I think here. These are two cisterns, that one and that one. No, no. one one cistern. Ah, one cistern, okay. Yeah. Where, where, is it, where is it located, sorry? Under here. Ah, under here, okay, great. Yeah. So, no question. <laughs> okay. All uh, right. So, uh, when you build a boomerang, this berm is either level or the highest point of the berm is the downslope side. <clears throat> because you never want water to flow over the berm. Because if you do, you're going to create a steeper flow and more erosion. 
So instead, it backs water up, and then it goes around the side, the same slope it was already traveling on. No erosion, or less erosion. Okay? All right, now I want to show you some strategies for flatter land. These are basins. So here, the rooftops drain to a common landscape or garden area. Did I show these slides already? No, just no. Oh, okay. So uh, these basins are a half meter deep, more or less. And between the basins is a raised path. So your feet are always high and dry. Okay. We built this in an area with high clay soils. So the percolation rate is very slow. If we left it like that, we risk breeding more mosquitoes. We don't want mosquitoes. Okay. So we put the sponge in place. We put in 100 millimeters of organic mulch on the surface and planted living pumps of vegetation. Plants. Some seed too, but mostly plants. And we had uh, 50 millimeters of rain fall in one hour, and it all infiltrated in 20 minutes because we had the sponge. Okay. Looking from above, that same site is this. The slope is this way. The rectangles with numbers are the buildings. The shaded area is the common landscape. The circles are trees, and the landscape is broken up into many basins. There is no water flowing off this site. It's all caught here. Okay. So we had a civil engineer add up the cumulative storage capacity of all these basins together, and it exceeded the water holding capacity of a conventional stormwater system by 10 times. So this is not only a superior flood control strategy, it is also the foundation of a water sustainable landscape. <coughs> because all this vegetation is irrigated only with rainwater and household wastewater, no drinking water. And it's now the vegetation is so big you can't see the other houses. It's all really big. Okay, so what are these basins? Well, typically they are a level bottomed basin for even infiltration through the whole basin. And when you try to figure out what plants do you plant in the basin, and what do you plant next to the basin? My answer to that is, go take a hike! Okay? And I mean that in a good way. I, I want you to go hike in the uh, intact 
uh, locations of your local uh, ecosystem, healthy parts of your ecosystem, and see what plants naturally grow in the low spots where they get lots of water and sediment. Those same plants you want to put in your low spots. And what plants need better drainage? Like maybe a fruit tree needs better drainage. So you put it on the high spot where the base of the tree is high and dry, you don't get rot, but it's close enough to the basin that the roots can access the water. Okay. Uh, so sometimes it's appropriate to plant the tree on a slight mound within a basin or on a raised terrace on the side of a basin. Okay. And if you're planting trees, think like the tree. This shaded area is the, uh, the area from which the tree takes water up through its roots. And notice that most of the area it uptakes water is beyond the drip edge of the canopy. So a lot of times people think they have to put the basin under the tree. Well, you don't have to. You can put it beyond the drip edge. The roots will still get the water. <laughs> and if you have an existing tree, do not dig the basin under the tree that is already there, because you will dig up its roots. Instead, come beyond the canopy and then make the basin. I was just thinking, your olive trees might be OK, because you're always plowing under them. So maybe they're OK. I don't know. If you have a small yard or garden with lots of plants in it, you don't have room to make basins. So sometimes you can create a raised berm or mound around the perimeter of the yard. And then the yard becomes a basin. But you must be careful. Because if this mound backs water up into your house, now your house is a basin. <laughs> and that's not good. Okay. In a small garden or yard, I want to put my basins on the perimeter against the wall or the fence so that I don't uh, take away my gathering space right outside my door. Okay. Maybe this is obvious to you, but Many people, including myself, who have gotten excited about harvesting water, put a basin right outside the door. And then you never go outside anymore. <laughs> because you always fall into the basin. So don't do that. Here, we have a basin, it's very hard to see, against a wall of the property wall. And we slope the pathway away from the house so we don't flood the house. Okay. And this gets rainwater and gray water from the washing machine, both. Okay. In a more urban setting, 
we have basins right outside everyone's apartment door, but to the side, so you can walk out. <laughs> uh, and uh, water will come from the roof, but it can also come from the driveway. And it overflows here and can go to the next and to the next. Any overflow water then goes into this open channel that runs through the development. Lots of life, very nice. Okay. Uh, when we have these basins, we can have stepped basins on a sloped site or on a flat site every basin overflow can be the same level and then we can make the basin bottoms different heights if we want the only thing that matters is that the elevation relationship between the two spillways. If we want water to go this direction, the spillways have to be level with one another or continually drop in elevation. That makes sense. Okay. Right. When we make a basin, there are three key elevations we want to pay attention to. And after lunch, I'm going to test you on this. First, we want the basin to hold water. So, we make sure the basin bottom is deeper than the overflow you should have at least, I would like 20 centimeters, okay? Difference, 20 centimeters, yeah. So you hold some water, you hold 20 centimeters of water. Um, maybe that's obvious to you, but Many times I see people make the overflow the same level as the bottom of the basin and they don't harvest any water. Okay. Next, you want to make sure the edge of your basin is at least 20 centimeters more or less higher than the spillway. Why is that? Because if you are standing here, between the basin and the house, and you are talking to somebody that you are sexually attracted to, you might get nervous when you're talking. <laughs> and you might shuffle your feet. And before you know it, you have dug a new overflow <laughs> that goes to your house. <laughs> okay. So make sure the overflow you want is definitely going to be the overflow. All right. So the first two elevations are the most important. The third one is just extra safe. So you want to make sure the edge of your basin or earthwork <coughs> is at least 20 centimeters lower than anything you don't want flooded. So if your overflow gets blocked with debris or garbage or something, it won't back water up against your house. Is that clear? Okay. 
So this is an example of a parking garage that is using these three elevations. Well, two, the first two elevations. So first, all the water off the roof of the parking garage irrigates the trees that shade the walls of the parking garage. So the water comes off the roof to the downspout pipe, which fills the basin that runs along the wall of the parking garage. And the curb, the raised curb next to the sidewalk, keeps the water in the planter area. And then they have the overflow drain, which is mm, 10, no, 100 millimeters, maybe 150 millimeters higher than the bottom of the basin. But it's uh, 50 millimeters lower than the curb, top of the curb. So it fills with water and then the overflow there, not to the sidewalk. All right, but I love that this is reducing the heat island effect by shading the walls. Normally, I find parking garages very ugly and life numbing <laughs> or killing. <laughs> but this one, I love to visit it every time I go to Portland. <laughs> okay. And they have concerts up on the roof with a great view of the city. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yesterday we talked about watersheds. Just to review briefly, we. Um, so, looking from above, this would be a big building roof with the parking lot around it. That would be an IKEA, okay? And uh, in, the U in the United States, typically people drain all the water to a big basin at the bottom. They don't use the water. So if instead we send the water to many small basins all throughout the parking lot, we can grow trees to shade the parking lot irrigated only with the water running off the parking lot. And then we only need a small basin at the bottom to capture the overflow. Uh, this is a housing development in the United States, a horrible housing development. <laughs> so uh, this is the middle of the housing development. All the water from the roofs, the yards, the whole development drains along the street and then into this basin. Okay? It's the armpit of the development. But it should be the heart of the development because it's in the middle of the development. But because all the flood water goes here, it's dangerous. So they have to fence it off and wall it off, and nothing grows. Because there's too much water when it rains, and when there's no rain, it's a solar oven. So um, uh, they call these basins detention basins, because it detains the water. And sorry, this joke will only work in English. Um, I hate detention because it's a slow death under fluorescent lights. Because in school, if you're bad, they put you in detention. Uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Bad language joke. Okay. So um, to make this better, 
if every house harvested water in its own yard, some of the water, they would have more vegetation, nicer yard. And if along the road they harvested more of the water, there'd be street trees. And then only the overflow could come to the basin, not all the flow. If they did that, they could remove the walls, make the fence low or remove the fence, and they could have much more vegetation, and this would be a park. And it would be a wonderful place. And instead of a detention basin, it would be a recess basin, a place where you play. So this used to be like that. But everybody who lives upslope started to harvest water and grow vegetation and put in rainwater tanks. So they reduced the amount of water going here so there's no more floods. So they created a community garden in the detention basin. Any questions on that? <coughs> yeah. yeah. I got the microphone. Oh, wait. Il parcheggio di cui parlavamo prima, il troppo pieno poi dove finisce? Qui, overflow. Ah, the parking overflow goes. The last slide. Last slide. Where does the parking overflow go? Oh, okay. So, yeah, in Portland, the parking garage overflow uh, unfortunately goes to the storm drain. So it's not used again. Um, so that could have been improved if their overflow water went to a natural channel or something. Yeah, so it could be better. And it, the overflow goes into that storm drain, that round storm drain. Okay, so the garden is here. That used to be a basin. Well, it still is. And there's another basin here, another there, another there. But everywhere in this development, people started making smaller basins, rainwater tanks, to collect the water higher in the watershed. And as a result, it, they changed. Here they made a basin, planted it. After planting, nice trees, shade, irrigated just with the rainwater. Because they're now holding it, not draining it. Uh, I'm gonna skip that. Okay, if your house is in the low point of the landscape and all the water drains to your house, this is how my house used to be. Okay. Um, is this a green house? Yeah, it was a rotting house for a while. Uh, so a way we can fix that is let's uh, reduce the watershed or the water catchment draining water to the house. So here on this side, we can dig out the soil to make a berm here. So now this water cannot come to the house anymore. It stops there. And the roof water drains away from the house, not to the house. On this side, we can do even better. We cut away to get positive drainage away from the house. We make a berm or a terrace wall here. So this water cannot come to the house. And then we take the roof water through a downspout pipe to the cistern 
on the high part of the property that overflows here, not to the house. And since the water is on the high part, we can use gravity to move the water inside the house if we want. Okay. Now, uh, if you have a wood house or a brick house, not, not a stone house, it is important that you don't dig this dirt and put it against your wall because <laughs> you will rot your house. So your house most likely has concrete or stone uh, foundation and stem wall. You don't want to put dirt above the top of your stem wall or, you, or moisture from the dirt will go into your wood wall or into your bricks and erode your bricks. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Um, now we'll talk about porous pavement. <coughs> so porous pavement is a pavement that lets water go through it into the ground below. This is my favorite. It's broken up pieces of sidewalk, concrete sidewalk, that were reused to make a porous patio because there's gaps between the concrete so water can infiltrate. And you're turning a waste, thrown away concrete chunks into a resource. Free patio material. Okay. You can spend more money and get concrete pavers that have gaps between them that you fill with gravel. Okay. Or this product is uh, landscape fabric that you put over the ground with little plastic cups about that big in diameter and that deep with no bottom. And the cups are on top of the fabric and you cover that with gravel. Small rocks. Why do you do that? The fabric is so the little rocks, the gravel, don't get pushed into the ground and, and get lost. The little plastic cups that are tied together act like a snowshoe. So if a fire truck full of water drives over this when everything is very wet, it won't get stuck in the mud because the weight is spread out over more area. Okay. And wheelchairs can go over it. Okay, so the, the, uh, no, for me, my rule is I would only use porous pavement if I did not have an area next to the pavement where I could infiltrate the water. So porous pavement makes the most sense in a very urban setting where almost everything is paved over and you need some place to infiltrate the water. This landscape does not make sense to me for a porous pavement. Because they have lots of space here, lots of space there on the edge where they could direct the water flow. Okay? And the porous pavement is more expensive than regular pavement. So they could have just done regular pavement draining to the landscape. Okay? All right. When you use gravel, you want to use angular gravel, not round gravel. Because the angular locks into itself, so it doesn't move. But round gravel's like ball bearings, so you can 
slip and slide. Then you want open graded, which means the gravel is all the same size. Not dense graded. Dense graded has big and small particles. So there's very little air space. And it's, it doesn't hold as much water as this does. It has bigger air space. And again, with the porous pavement, it's important that the porous pavement be the high part of the land so it can drain surplus water into the landscape. This is bad. Here the landscape is higher than the porous pavement and dirt and sediment runs onto the pavement and fills your pores and then it's no longer porous. So this is porous pavement that is not doing do too good. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, this is a few days after the rain, but right after the rain, this is a lake. One, because they used the wrong gravel. There's lots of small parts, lots of clay in the gravel. So it's not very porous. But more importantly, the biggest mistake is all the water from this site drains to the parking lot. It's too much water in too small a space. So the way they are starting to fix this is they are creating a retaining, a terrace wall here, here, putting in a rainwater cistern, All here, they're holding more of the water before it goes to the parking lot. So they're shrinking the water catchment or the water sh shed that drains to the parking lot. Okay? That's the easiest fix there. Okay? All right. Now, berm and basins or swales, same thing. Here's your berm, the raised mound. Here's your basin. You dig the basin and put the berm on the downslope side. Okay. This is a contour berm that goes across the slope on a level line. And that's the boomerang berm again, the open-armed hug berm. Okay. Um, you can build these with snow. So this is in a city with, that gets snow. And they made a berm of snow that is collecting the melted snow running down the road. It diverts it over the sidewalk and into the yard where they have a big basin. You do not need a permit for this because the berm melts in a few hours. Okay. But I love that you're harvesting water with water. You harvest melted water with frozen water. This is a berm of mulch. Um, here's one, and there's the other. Uh, in New Mexico, there is a really bad drought, 
So lots of trees are dying. Uh, and they cut up the trees and then use the mulch to create contour berms. And you can see how much water that's holding in the, in the landscape. So after the rains, this is what it looks like with the grass growing. That top berm is here. The lower berm is here. Okay. These are only meant to be temporary. They're just setting up the conditions to allow this grass to grow. And the grass is the living berm. OK, so the problem with these berms, hmm, maybe you can see it. Uh, can you think of what the problem would be with this berm? Think about sheet flow. Think about the erosion triangle. Think about overflow. This, we have sheet flow that's just spread out over the land, is collected behind this berm. It's concentrated. If we get a lot of rain, it has to overflow somewhere. Where and how does it overflow? Yeah, okay. If it overflows over the whole berm, since the berm is now steeper than the normal slope, it's going to be more erosive, faster. And there's, there's no vegetation there. There's nothing stabilizing it. If you had grass, maybe it'd be okay. But a lot of times we'll make an overflow We'll stabilize it with rock. That's good. But all this sheet flow has now been concentrated to channelized flow. So we're more likely to have an erosive rill or gully here. Now, this can be OK if you're building these where you will maintain it, you will fix it if things start to erode. But it's not good to do out in the part of the field you never visit. Because there's a chance you'll start to create erosion that you'll never fix. Okay. So I'm going over this because I came from the permaculture world that loves swales, <laughs> okay? Loves berm and basins. And if you maintain them, they can be really good. But if you don't maintain them, they can be really bad because they concentrate sheet flow into channelized flow, which can cause more erosion, okay? As long as you are aware of that and you design for that, you, you can be OK. So one way you can design an overflow of a swale is not a narrow overflow, but a very wide overflow. So here, we put no berm on the downslope side. Just cut the basin, and then when the basin fills with water, the water can spread out over a wide area. And since there's no berm on the downslope side, we don't have the steeper slope of the berm. Does that make sense? <coughs> Everyone's okay? 
right. All right. Here is a different Berman Basin. This is in California, where they have wet winters. They have the, um, uh, their garden on raised beds, just like the garden we saw yesterday with the chilies. And then between each bed, they have the depressed furrow, which is running on contour. In a wet climate with annual plants, that's good. Okay? Because you don't rot the plant, but you still harvest the water. Okay? I don't know why that one's there, so okay. All right, so boomerang berms again. We already saw this. Just different view. All right. Okay, if you have lots of rocks, you can put them on the downslope side of your boomerang berm. But don't put it on the upslope side. Why not? What? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you, the the sediment flow will fill up the upslope side for you. You don't need to put any rocks there. You only need to protect the downslope side from which soil is flowing away, not flowing to. Hope that made sense. Okay, uh, we already saw this structure, so I'm not going to repeat it. Okay, now key line plowing. You can plow in a way that harvests water. This is the key line plow here, here. This is what the blade looks like. And it goes deep into the soil and creates a channel down beneath the soil. It is, if you're going to plow, <laughs> it's much better than this type of plowing, which turns the soil and brings subsoil up to the surface. It, it reverses the soil. That's bad. That's bad for the soil life. This plow does not turn the soil. It just breaks it. Okay? Okay. So where and how do you use this type of plowing? You find the key point of the land, which is where the steep slope becomes more gradual. That's the key point or key line. So here, they mark the contour, the level line of the landscape where steep slope, contour lines are closer together, meets more gradual slope. Contour lines get further apart. Okay. You mark that one. And then you make sure that below and above that key line, you, I'm going to go back here, you plow downhill at a very gradual slope so you pull water out of the valley, this is the valley, to the ridge. 
So this is the wet valley. We want to, with the plow, pull water to the dry ridge line. Let me show you another image. So we're looking down. Here, that's, that's a valley. That's a low spot. Here, that's another valley. This is the ridge. Okay? So when they plow and when they make their key line berms, this is at a very gradual slope away, down, away from the drainage to the ridge line. So when it rains, water is being pulled this way out to the dry ridge. Same thing here, it's being pulled to the dry ridge. So you get more even infiltration of water throughout the landscape. Any questions on that? A microphone. Ma arando in, in questo modo, quell'erba che poi in estate si secca, non c'è il rischio che si incendi? Non rovesciandola? Si traduce? Digging, uh, and plowing in this manner, uh, what about the grass that grows and dries in the summer like we have here? Isn't there a danger of it burning, catching on fire? Because we have to cut all the grass here. Because yeah. This doesn't address the fire effect. Okay. So you would have to deal with your grass in some other way. Maybe you graze animals on the grass before it dries out. Um, but this plowing is not about weeding. It's only about uh, moving water from the low spots to the high spot ridges. Okay. Um, and you could typically you only do it three times and then you never do it again. Okay? So the first year, you plow shallow. The second year, you plow again, but deeper. And the third year, you plow one more time, the deepest. And then that's it. Okay? Um, this is an example where they created key line berms on which they planted the grapes and then between the key line berms they are doing key line plowing. And they spaced the berms to the width of the plow and the tractor for easy access. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah. Eh, avendo noi un terreno molto pietroso, eh, l'aratro Yeomans eh, diciamo, permette di, mh, questo tipo di aratura in un terreno molto pietroso e soprattutto avendolo anche a bassa profondità, diciamo, non, non molto profondo, eh, riesce a funzionare anche su questo tipo di terreni? rocks yeah yeah I don't think so I think you would break the plow okay. yeah so in here what I think would be more appropriate is key line berms on the surface not not breaking through all that rock So yeah, this probably, in your shallow soil, probably won't work. Yeah. Ma uh, la key line la trovate uh, solo dalle mappe oppure anche guardando 
la morfologia. Do you uh, look for uh, key line uh, on maps uh, looking at uh, sea um, line level or looking at uh, natural morphology on, uh, on the field crop? Uh, I usually look on the ground. Yeah. And it's very easy now. You can get a level on the tractor and it will tell you if you're going uphill or downhill when you're driving the tractor. So it's, it's very easy to do now. From the up to down or when you're going horizontal, you want to go downhill slightly. And it can tell you, you can adjust your level in the tractor and it can tell you how, how you're doing. Um, okay. Uh, this guy is the best teacher I have found for key line plowing, if you want more information. And uh, that's his website. Um, because while he plows, he also has compost tea uh, that he injects. And he also can lay down drip irrigation line at the same time. He has all this set up on his plow. And he's a crazy man. That's very funny. So he's fun to fun to be with. Okay. So uh, terracing. Um, I don't need to teach you guys this. You know how to do it. It's a rich tradition here. But um, this uh, this is in Los Angeles, California, and this is broken up concrete chunks, and. Uh, the company that does this, they typically charge 40,000 US dollars for a typical landscape like this. So they're making a lot of money turning garbage into beautiful walls. <laughs> to make these terrace walls. Uh, which one? For the, for the whole set. Yeah. Okay. The movie stars are paying them to do it. Uh, okay. Um, if you have a 33% uh, 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 slope or less, it's possible to do terraces without the retaining walls. If it's steeper than 33%, uh, it's better to have the retaining wall. And above 50% slope, don't do the wall, just do vegetation. So um, again, I feel kind of stupid talking about terraces to you all, but uh, if you want the info, uh, this is a calculation you can use, if you want, that determines how far you should space the walls from one another. So the width between terraces equals the maximum depth you can cut into the soil divided by the degree of the slope of the land. If you like math, you can use it. If you don't like math, don't worry. Okay. Um, yeah, you know that. I would just say, uh, I think this is obvious again to you all, but just to make sure, when you build the terrace wall, you must lean the terrace wall into the slope. And even better, every rock must angle into the slope so that gravity does not push your wall over. Okay. All right. Uh, more beautiful movie star <laughs> concrete chunk uh, retaining walls. <coughs> All right. Now, maximizing the living sponge and organic matter. Oh, I should take a break. Maybe we should stop. Yeah. And we're, lunch is at one usually? Yeah. Okay, sorry. I, we got to give a break. <laughs> So let's do like a 10 minute break.
Is that okay for you guys? And check the gnomon with the sun. Okay. <laughs> no, I'll wait till after. Otherwise, I'll be here. Right? <laughs> okay. Okay. So. Uh, All these different water harvesting strategies, they all try to do the same thing, which is just slow down, spread out, and infiltrate more of the water. It's up to you to figure out which strategy is appropriate in each different context. And maybe none of the strategies I've talked about will be appropriate for the unique conditions of your site. Maybe instead it will be a hybrid that you create by mixing different strategies. All right. Um, but uh, whatever the strategy, um, Again, it's really important on the land that we try and maximize the living and organic sponge. So this is what I like. This is not what I like. This is becoming more common in the United States, and it scares me. Do you know what he's doing? He's vacuuming his yard. <laughs> okay. So he spent a lot of money on rocks that he put out into his yard. He did that so it would use less water than grass. But now he is trying to keep it very clean and he's vacuuming the leaves that fall on his rocks. And he's then uh, mining the nutrients that were in the leaves out of his land. Okay. This I like more. Uh, our fire threat is less than you have here, but we purposely cut up the prunings into smaller parts to reduce the fire risk of brush you can reduce it even more by running it through a chipper. Okay. Um, uh, we have been so successful. Uh, well, I already showed this, yeah? No? Okay. We've been so successful growing trees along the street in our neighborhood that are irrigated with the water coming off the street through the curb cut that the trees are starting to block the footpath because they're getting so big. The city does not like that because they have no money for maintenance of landscapes along the street. So we, uh, uh, and also 12 to 14 percent of the solid waste in the city is yard trimmings. It's crazy that that much of the, of the junk in the dump is organic matter from just pruning trees. That's, that's our fertility. So we have uh, organized tree 
pruning workshops that are free to the community in different neighborhoods to show people how to prune their own trees the correct way. And then they put all the prunings on the curb of the street. And then a week later, we hire a chipper shredder service to come and chip up the prunings. And they either put them back on the street curb, where, and people can distribute their mulch in their yard as they like. Or if they don't like it, it goes in the truck. And then the truck delivers it to the neighborhood community garden or other strategy. So it never leaves the land. Okay? Is yeah. there a difference between pruning and trimming? No, it's the same thing. It's the same. Yeah, prunings and trimmings are the same. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. And it's real important that we are collecting that organic matter because that is the food for the soil life. And uh, uh, let's see. So I covered some of that yesterday. Yes. So I think I talked about all that yesterday. Yeah. The bioremediation of the soil life. Yeah. So, okay. Good. Anything, uh, slideshow. I didn't? Okay. So uh, we have researchers at the University of Arizona that are looking at uh, our water harvesting street side uh, basins. And they have found that um, the trees uh, in the basins with the organic mulch get to be much larger than the trees with rock mulch, in part because there's more fertility in the soil with more soil life. Uh, and the temperatures are lower, so the moisture lingers or sticks around longer. Um, they've also been finding that the organically mulched soil has 10 times the bioremediation ability or natural filtration ability of rock mulch soil. Because the organic matter is food for many of the microorganisms that filter those contaminants. Okay. And uh, I did or did not talk about mycorrhizal? I did. Oh, no, that was by the garden, right. OK. OK, so then uh, also that mulch is a primary food source of a certain fungus that will tap its fungus roots into the roots of the plants. And they have this wonderful cooperative arrangement where the fungus roots give the plants minerals uh, and uh, water. And the plants roots give the fungus roots sugars and carbohydrates. OK, so if you have this fungus in your soil and its roots tap into the roots of the plants, you dramatically increase the surface area of the plant's roots because it's the plant's roots and the fungus roots together. So then the tree is able to uptake much more water because it has much more surface area of root. Okay? So this is really important because if you do all this work to harvest the water in the soil, if you want to get the best benefit, you want to make sure the roots can uptake that moisture. So you want more roots, more surface area. And this is why you want the beneficial fungus and the beneficial bacteria as well. And their primary food source is the carbon of the leaves, the prunings, 
the roots, you know, all that organic matter. So do you understand why we want the sponge? Are you excited about the sponge? Okay, I'm, I'm so excited. Okay, all right. This is a great way to get more organic matter. So um, I'm sitting on my compost toilet and using it. Um, and this is the finished material, okay? It is thoroughly composted. We are very careful on how we compost it. So when it's finished, there's no problem with E. coli, no problem with salmonella, no problem with fecal matter. Because after composting, it's no longer shit. <laughs> now it's soil, okay? So, uh, and it's, it's fertile soil. So, uh, this is what is in your urine, okay? So, in one year, an adult will urinate nine pounds of nitrogen, almost a pound of phosphorus, and just over two pounds of potassium. That's good stuff. That's enough. Oh, can you convert? Three. Okay. And what's this one? So square feet to square meters? Okay, so that's pretty good. So when you invite friends over, have them drink more wine and collect that urine. Okay. The, uh, the, the only problem with urine is the salt. So you need to flush or dilute the salts. Yeah, well, that's good. But that's where you want to collect rainwater in the same areas you deposit the urine. So rainwater has no salt. So you dilute those salts. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, you, mm. you can also, can you mix your urine, like, I mean, say you have a bucket, your urine with eight or ten par parts or something of water and directly go and mm -hmm. water your garden with that? Ho chiesto se eh, con un secchiello si può mescolare la propria urina in parti, un, un par, una parte di urina, otto, dieci parti di acqua e andare direttamente a innaffiare certe piante. Yeah. So in three, yes, and three to six parts water to one part urine is fine. So, sorry, just to tell a funny story, uh, I, um, I have these buckets, and uh, I pee in the bucket, and then I add water, and I take the bucket to my plants along the street when I just plant them. And there's a hole in the bucket, so it slowly gives the water to the plant. So a friend of mine, he had been working in the dirt, and his, he was very dirty, and uh, he was hot. So he went to the bucket, he's like, ah, water. Washed his hands, washed his face, and then he's like, wait a minute. And he said, ah, this is one of Brad's buckets. <laughs> Okay. He didn't drink it, no. Yeah? Is it, how is it? Not for fun. Not for fun, no. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, one other thing about this. Oh, the story? Okay. 
magari a 6 parti di acqua, perché io pensavo di più, dice non c'è bisogno di 8 10 parti di acqua, basta da 3, da 3 a 6. Yeah. Okay, so uh, when uh, we put moisture into the ground um, and when we also put nutrients into the ground, they're much more available to the plants if there is more organic matter in that soil as well. So I look at urine as the nutrient source and the fecal matter as the organic matter source. And it's almost like it was designed that way. Think about that. <laughs> and if you think too about plants need phosphorus, we don't. So uh, there is only about 130 years of mineable phosphorus left in the world. We are mining and consuming phosphorus so fast Say it again. They didn't understand the translation. Or they couldn't hear it or understand it. Okay. So um, most, I'm going to say it slightly differently. Most chemical fertilizers, synthetic fertilizers, use phosphorus. Okay. And, okay. and plants need phosphorus. Okay. So for many decades, we have been mining phosphorus from the earth to put into fertilizer. Uh, before we mined it, we got it from animals. Okay? Because we are mining it so fast and at such high volumes, there is only 130 years worth of phosphorus that we can mine on this planet. Okay. So after Allora, ci sono cave per l'estrazione del fosforo. Il fosforo è stato estratto in maniera talmente tanto ingente che adesso ne abbiamo pochissimo da estrarre ancora. Solo 130 anni. Ah, great, perfect. <laughs> okay. So, um, so in 130 years, we will not be able to make fertilizer like we do now. It, will, it won't be possible. Uh, yeah. And most of our food is dependent on that fertilizer. Is this scary? No, no. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. So when we eat, when we eat the food grown with this, we let the phosphorus right out of our body. So the good news is, we don't need the phosphorus, just the plants do. So the solution is coming out of our butt every day. <laughs> Part of the solution. Okay, so if we were to capture that resource instead of throw it away, we could make a much better situation. I just want to show the potential. Okay, so um, now here's how we can transition from drainage infrastructure to harvest infrastructure. This is a concrete drain. All the water leaves. There's no life. So what happened is they took jackhammers and jackhammered that up and left all the concrete in place. 
They did not take it away. And they put a few native rocks to make it look a little more natural. And then they put in some seed and plants. And all this vegetation is now irrigated for free just by the water that flows through, but now infiltrates. I volumi di acqua che riescono a scorrere nel canale di cemento sono gli stessi oppure le piante riescono ad assorbire abbastanza per fare in modo che comunque non ci sia un'inondazione allagamento visto che comunque abbiamo aggiunto altro materiale nel canale se quello è lo stesso canale abbiamo aggiunto materiale è possibile che ci sia un allagamento oppure le piante riescono ad assorbire l'acqua in eccesso che ci sarebbe I don't know basically since we have some materials like in the canal that was supposed to take a certain volume of water do the plants assure enough absorbing of the water so that we haven't got flooding or overflow from the mm. Okay, so the, uh, this still works like a drain. It's just that most of the water infiltrates. So if there's a big flood, it still can leave. So no flooding. But it's just that more of that water is absorbed before it leaves. Yeah, that's, mes that's mesquite, and so is that. Yeah. Yeah. Would you not worry about having the cement? Yeah, let's get the microphone. Uh, would you not worry about having cement, um, which is a bit toxic, on the ground? Mm. Anyone want to translate for the microphone? Uh, non si preoccupa ah, you can avere do it. cemento per terra, perché è un po' tossico. No? So the, um, the concrete is fine. It's more alkaline, but it's really not a toxin for the soil. It's, it's okay. It's pretty inert. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, this is where there used to be a much wider road that has been narrowed. If you see this green strip, that line, that's where the street curb used to be. They pushed the curb into the street, depressed this area, and made curb cuts to allow the water in. Now the tree gets more water. Its roots are better aerated. It grows taller. It shades more of the street, cooling it in summer. And by narrowing the street, cars drive slower, making it safer for her. It's beautiful, it's great. How do you get this to happen in your neighborhood? Well, if you're in Portland, Oregon, where this is, they uh, have a certain uh, problem. And that problem is the sewer pipe that gets your toilet water is the same pipe that gets the storm water, the rain water. And in really big rain events, there's so much storm water in the pipes that there's not enough room for the toilet water. So turds or shit starts to float up into people's basement drains. 
in the in this town? Or? No, in yeah. body. In body? Uh huh. Yeah. 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 So yeah, same same problem you're finding in the ocean, where the shit goes into the sea, and you have to swim with those brown fish. So, okay. So, uh, so it's, it's disgusting to have shits float up into your house or into the ocean. And uh, so this is horrible, but it can also be really good because nothing generates political will like a turd or a shit floating up into your house. So when turds appear in people's basement drains, people call mayor and council, they call their political politicians, and they say, I don't care what it takes. Get this shit out of my house. Okay. Sorry, did they call you to compost it? No, no. So, so the city has mapped all the neighborhoods in the city by their watershed boundaries. This is one watershed of many in the city. This particular watershed has a very high shit to basement ratio. <laughs> Say it again. This, this, uh, so this uh, this particular neighborhood or watershed in Portland, Oregon has a very high shit to basement drain ratio, meaning there's a lot of shit floating up into the basements of the homes in this neighborhood. Okay? So, this is where the city is willing to put money to address the problem. Okay. ha una particolarmente elevata eh, percentuale di pioggia relativa alla merda che esce negli scantinati delle persone. È quello? No, quanti litri di merda per flusso di acqua e semiterraneo? Sì, relativo al flusso dell'acqua, la merda è molto elevata e allora esce negli scantinati. E la prima battuta per dire che in quella zona hanno un grossissimo problema di risaluta di estrementi dei bagni. No, degli scantinati, esce sì, degli scarichi degli scantinati, scantinati dove esce se, se c'è un allagamento. Sì, ma senza perché la percentuale di aggiusti di logici non per dire che quanto è la Nella merda. Sì. <ride> ok. So, the city in the year uh, 2000 had a plan to make all the pipes bigger and to put more pipes so they could send the shit to the river faster. Okay? So this would have made less shit in the houses, in the basements of the houses, but it doesn't make the community more healthy because now the river is much more polluted more quickly. And it was very expensive to put in more pipe. It would cost $144 million. And Ben's about to convert that. <laughs> so, uh, so thankfully, before they did the work, they changed their idea. And instead of making more bigger pipes, they decided to instead 
harvest more of the rain before it got to the pipe with rain gardens, water harvesting, porous pavement. And that reduced the cost by $58 million. And it also improved the health of the river because there was less of this water going to the, to the river, less of the polluted water going to the river, more of the soil. May, may, may say, uh, yeah. The ratio uh, organic matter, sheet water, the ratio sheet water was, was higher in the, in the pipes. Higher in the pipes. Uh, so we have to treat a less amount of water, of dirty yeah. water. That's, that's the, uh, the matter. And the, so the, the, I think the most part of the, of the expense over 146 million of dollars was in the new treatment plants. No, not in treatment. It was in pipes. Just pipes, no treatment. Plants. And digging the pipes, excavating the pipes. So they switched from it all being the expensive plan was all below the surface. The less expensive plan was more on the surface. Yeah. Do we need any translation of any of that or we're good? There's a microphone. La diminuzione dell'acqua messa in, uh, in, uh, nelle acque reflue, insomma, non è che diminuiva la quantità uh, di, uh, di uh, liquami da trattare, ma diminuiva la quantità di acqua in totale che andava a mare, quindi era più facile trattarla. Dai, dalle piogge, l'acqua che dalle piogge si diminuiva. Perfetto, però la quantità di, diciamo così, di, di, di reflui, uh, la, la quantità di, di merda, era la stessa. Ok. All right. So... In Seattle, Washington, they used to have a very wide street, but they made it narrower so that they could make it curvilinear, and that's sexier. And it also slows traffic, so it's safer. Then they had the room to make bigger basins on either side of the road. Traffic is moving so slow, they only needed a sidewalk on one side of the street, not both. So they could make more basin. A few years after planting, this is how, how it looked. This reduced runoff by 98%. And the fish used to be dying in the creeks because there was too much pollutants from the road and the water temperature was too hot coming off the road. Now, the water temperature is cooler because of all the shade and the water is traveling under the surface, not on the surface. This is filtering the pollutants so the health of the fish is improving. Okay. All right. Uh, this is in Tucson. Here, we, there's nothing growing here. So we removed the dirt and made it depressed. So now the water can flow off the road into here. We put wildflower seeds. Bah, life for free. Okay. All right. Uh, this is photographs with the water in front of my house. You saw this yesterday. Here's the water flowing in, filling up, continuing on. That's my nephew. The water fills up. Okay, you can see how it works. This is uh, where they made, they cut the curb to let the street run off into the basin. But what is bad about this? Stone. Why? What, what is bad about the stone? Yeah, it's the, 
the main thing is the stone is too high. Yeah, so it's higher than the street. So yeah, it can't get in like it used to. So we, we don't need any stone on the bottom, only the side. So I don't know why they put stone in. But. All right, this is where there was no curb. It's just street and dirt. What happened before the work water would flow into the house. <laughs> so they dug basins, put the dirt on the pathway, and now it works great. Okay. They made a stone wall to... No, that's the house. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you had questions about the urban setting yesterday. So here, they uh, cut out the basin for the tree, put a steel grate over it, and made an opening for the water. It's not enough water for the tree. So it's a very small basin. But it's better than no water. Okay. Um, And when doing this work in the city, the biggest problem I find is the utilities, the gas line, the uh, electric, the water, and the internet. It's where you want to plant the water and the trees. And so you can't do it. Repeat it? OK. So, the, uh, the, in, the, in the urban environment, the problem is we have many underground utilities, like water line, gas line, internet. And they, they are put everywhere in the, next to the street. They're, they're not thinking about where you might want to plant a tree or where you might want to plant the water. And we can't, uh, we're not allowed to dig within a certain distance of those utility lines. So what we need to do and what we're starting to do in my community is in all new development, the utilities have to be placed in a utility corridor, ideally under the walkway where you don't want to plant anything. Oh, hold on just a sec. And we move the walkway away from the street so that we can plant the trees and the water right next to the street and create a barrier of trees between pedestrian and cars. Okay. Allora, ehm, il problema è che in Italia le utenze e i cavi devono essere messi in una determinata maniera e anche a determinate profondità all'interno della sezione di strada di marciapiede che si sta facendo. Quindi alle volte può essere complicato ehm, fare quella soluzione di metterle vicino. I don't know how it works in the United States, but in Italy when uh, utilities are uh, put in the ground, uh, they have to respect uh, a distance uh, one between uh, each other. And uh, they must have a uh, depth in ground. Uh, first, uh, mm, above all, what uh, about uh, Fonia? Sewage. Sewage. So I think when, you, um, when uh, someone is going to project a new uh, water harvesting, how can solve this problem? Well, it's sometimes it's not easy, but uh, it's possible they're doing it now. Um, and part of it has been a dialogue with the utilities to try and reduce the spacing somewhat. It's not always simple and no. uh, it's not always easy to do or it's not always possible to do because yeah. you have large ways. In Italy we don't have large ways yeah. and that's a real problem. No,
So you're right, sometimes it's not possible. Yeah. Yeah, if it were under the street, then it'd be. So um, the, the point is that we need to be conscious of the need to plant water and trees as well as utilities. And then, when possible, design for that. Now, sometimes we can put the utilities or the trees in the street. Okay? So here, uh, uh, this is forcing the traffic to meander, slows it down, works really well. Um, this is in a parking lot uh, where all the water used to go down the, the driving lane of the parking lot, but they put in a asphalt speed hump berm that directs the water to the plantings. Okay, nice retrofit. Uh, now I'm going to talk about daylighting buried waterways. So when we bury or cover a waterway and pipe, we can take out the pipe and let the water see the daylight again. Okay. So this use under this road is a buried waterway or a piped water, storm water. Okay. So what they did is they they dug up the street and made a park in one block of street. And here is the waterway that now, with the vegetation, filters the water, infiltrates some of the water. So you have a healthier water system than that, which is dead. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is a photograph from, of what the uh, Cheongjigchong River <laughs> used to look like in South Korea, in Seoul, South Korea. After the Korean War, they paved over the river, put a double-decker highway over it. And then uh, in um, 2004, the mayor of Seoul said, we will bring the river back. And he had lots of people saying no. But he did it anyway. And this is what it looks like now. So uh, lots of ducks, fish, vegetation. Um, it's amazing. In a city that is completely dominated by the automobile, this is a wonderful place where you can walk or ride a bike, no problem with cars, and uh, lots of life. Um, and uh, they have many different things. Underneath the bridges, they have art galleries and stages for performances. They, people get married here all the time. Uh, they have concerts. They found uh, a Chinese pedestrian bridge that had been from the 14th century that had been buried by the highway. And they brought it back. So there's the history. Um, and uh, I love this. When I saw it, I was like, what are the crosses? What is this? These are the supports of the old highway. And it's like they're in varying stages of decomposition. It's like road warrior art, <laughs> apocalyptic art. OK. So, um, but the other amazing thing is every waterway that drains into the river they gave the same treatment. So you can walk or run to all parts of the city following the water. I love it. OK. Because it's, it's about more life. Okay. 
So now let's talk. That is all about celebrating and showing the flow. <laughs> we can do that in other ways. Here we have the steelhead trout are swimming up the roof downspout to the insurance office roof. And the water is caught in the rain garden below. Okay. In downtown Seattle, the streets used to be very wide and dead. So the people living along the street and the people working along the street wanted more life. So they proposed these drawings where they would narrow the street, plant street trees that would get irrigated by street runoff or the water from the roofs. And now they're implementing that. The water from this roof comes down the pipe into the cistern that's shaped like a hand reaching for the sky and the water. So the water goes in the finger, fills up the arm, and overflows out the thumb into terraced garden beds that are gardened by the people living in the condominium. Nice! <laughs> okay. Uh, you, if you web search Growing Vine Street, you'll see many more photos. <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, you can get more information in these great books. Okay, on <laughs> that website. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> And uh, that's pretty good for time. Okay, so uh, now uh, it's lunch. And uh, after lunch, we will uh, use some very simple tools and make water harvesting earthworks. Okay. <laughs>